everyone. My name is Juan Bueren, and as Vice President of the European Society for Gene and Cell Therapy, I am very pleased to introduce to all of you Dr. Hildegard Bunin, who is the current president of our society and who will give a really very interesting talk today about adeno-associated viral vectors. Dr. Bunin is a member of the German Center for Infection Research and also professor for infection biology and gene transfer at the Institute of Experimental Hematology at the Hanover Medical School. And as I said at the beginning, she is the current president of the ESGCT, in which she is developing an incredible work to improve communication and also teaching in very different aspects of gene therapy vectors and applications. And because of her great work and uh, as president of the society, indeed, all of us are very grateful to Hildegard. She has a long standing expertise in the area of viral vectors development, very particularly with adeno associated viral vectors. She has published more than 100 publications in peer reviewed journals and has also filled several patents related to these vectors. And today she will clarify for all of us different aspects of the AAV vector system, followed by examples on how to optimize the vector system, how to increase the transduction efficacy in hard to transduce cells, and also how to redirect AAV tropism towards novel predefined receptors. As a reminder, uh, you can see in the screen that you can write your questions throughout the presentation so that at the end of the talk, I will try to summary your main questions to Dr. Bunin in order to have further clarifications of her presentation. So once again, many thanks Hildegard and now all of us are looking forward to learning from your talk. Thanks a lot. Uh, please spell, uh, press your mute, Hildegard. I think you are silenced. If not, I try to do it like this. Yes. Can you hear me now? I can, yes, thank you. Okay, so thank you, Juan, and welcome to my talk today, which is entitled Adeno-Associated Virus Vectors to Teach an Old Virus New Tricks. And let us start to have a look at um, the virus AV vectors are derived from. So they are derived from Adeno-Associated Virus, which are members of the parvovirus family. And they have been identified in the late 16th of the last century as contamination of adenoviral preparation. And here you see a nice example. This is an adenovirus. And you have heard last week about adenoviral vectors from Len Seymour. And this here, this tiny little one here is an AV. AV vector, AVs belongs to the dependovirus uh, family, dependopavovirus family, because for uh, they are replication deficient and they require the help of other viruses such as adenovirus for uh, their replication and for progeny production. To date, uh, there is no uh, pathogenicity associated to AV. If we now zoom into adeno-associated virus, you see that we have as an outer shell a non-enveloped capsid 
of the size of 25 nanometer in diameter. So therefore the term pavo for little. And within this um, capsid, there is a single stranded DNA genome transported, which has approximately the size of 4.7 kilobases. And um, as you see, we have certain elements. So on one hand here, we have the so-called inverted terminal repeats at both ends of the viral genome. And they serve as origin of replication as well as as packaging signals. And they protect the single-stranded DNA from nucleases in the cell. When we move forward here, the RAP proteins are located. They are encoded in the RAP gene and they are a family of multifunctional non-structural proteins. And they are involved in replication, in transcription and in packaging and many other things as well. And here at the end of the genome, you find the CAP gene, which encodes for the capsid proteins. They are called WIP1, WIP2, and WIP3. WIP stands for viral protein. And we do have three different ones, as I said, WIP1, 2, and 3. And they build up the capsid in a 1 to 1 to 10 ratio. To help building up the capsid, AV encodes a further protein, which is called AP or assembly activating protein. And with these, you already know a lot about the virus. And if you now move forward to the vector, you replace all viral um, genes by your transgene expression cassette, which means you provide a promoter you provide your gene as well as the stop codon sequences. And um, the only thing which remains from the virus are the packaging signals, so the ITRs, which also flank at both ends your transgene expression cassette. And this DNA is then in the first generation AV vectors transported by the AV capsid, which, as I said, is a non enveloped protein capsid. Nature was quite um, nice to us because there is more than just one AV virus around. And you have here a list which is still growing. And um, the numbers are just um, really as they were identified. So the first one, one to six, were identified quite early. And then um, after 2000, people really digged into the genome. Of, of humans, of non-human primates, and were, uh, locate, and were identifying endogenous sequences of AV, and so the list is growing. And I really say it old virus, because due to the work of Alexander Ian from Australia, we know that also in kangaroo you find um, sequences of AV. So when you stay with me a minute here for this table, then you see that these different AV serotypes differ in the receptors they use for the first contact with the cell surface, which is called the attachment receptor. And they also differ with regard to the receptors that are then mediating the cell entry. And this then translates into a slight difference in the tissue preference. So in those tissues, they like to transduce. I have to tell you that we still lack all the information about the different receptors, attachment as well as co-receptors. And I would like also to point out that none of the natural occurring serotypes are really cell type specific. But as I said, they have certain preferences. So for example, as you might know, if you would like to transduce a mouse liver, AV serotype 8 would be a nice choice. So when we now have a closer look at the vector system, again, you see that I changed now the view on the capsid. And you see th these colorful regions here. And these regions are those regions which differ between the different serotypes. And they, they differ because we had an antigenic drift because of the development of antibodies. AV had to mutate certain residues to uh, allow to um, trans still transduce um, uh, new cell types and generate progeny. So that means that also different serotypes differ in the epitopes recognized by the immune system. 
So with this in hand, AV has emerged now from its development or identification more than 50 years ago now to the delivery uh, tool of choice for in vivo gene therapy. And you might know that um, until the end of last year, we had nine gene therapies which had a, a marketing approval uh, obtained in the Western world. And as a person working on AV, I'm quite proud that three of the drugs are based on AV vectors. And I really would like to point out that the first uh, gene therapy, which has received marketing approval in the Western world, was based on an AV1 vector, uh, which then delivered um, a transgene for the treatment of liver congenital amaurosis. Amaro um, for a monogenetic disease in the metabolism. Um, so if we now move forward, um, so although we have already these three marketing approvals with AV vectors, so again, for an eye disease, liver congenital amaurosis, here Glibera is the first uh, drug ever approved, and so again, SMAR for spinal muscular atrophy, um, and depending on where you look for more than 117 um, clinical trials are ongoing, there's still a lot which you have to do. And I would like to discuss with you uh, certain challenges which we still have to face. And one of them is that if you would like to go in vivo, that there is a certain range of off-target transduction because, and this is what we mean by off-target transduction, that the vectors which you, for example, deliver via tail vein injection is then not reaching or uh, with low efficacy reaching um, organs which uh, you don't want to, to, to reach. So for example, here we have a mouse where we have a tumor here and you give AV systemically and you would like to reach the tumor, but it's not reached with, uh, but it's reaching the spleen or the liver and this is off target for that certain um, application. Then we also face the issue of low um, transduction efficiency. That means that we have to use extremely high particle numbers to get the gene transferred or that um, we that the cell is not all not, not at all susceptible. Uh, I will discuss this example also. And the further challenge is that we do face the problem that a lot of us already were in contact with um, with AVs, and so that we do have already evolved antibodies which impair transduction. As you see here, these are cells which are treated with AV2 vectors, and these are the same cells with the same vector treated, but in the presence of neutralizing antibodies. So off-target transduction, low transduction efficiency, and pre-existing immunity. So um, if we would like to optimize AV in this regard, we have to optimize, of course, the vector system, but we also have to optimize the host or the interaction with the host. And this is what I would like to discuss with you today. And we would like, for a minute, let us stay with the capsid. And I would like to share with you the view on how a virus is approaching a cell and here in particular the AV, because we always think that, an a, that a virus infection is always quite efficient. So this is an HeLa cell. And what you see here are trajectories of AV particles, which were labeled by a fluorescent dye and were then observed in live cell uh, in single virus tracing. So a live cell microscopy. And when you count or look at more than 1,000 of these paths, you see that in solution, only half of these co contacts and interactions really result in an interaction with the cell. And then if it results in an interaction with the cell and you really zoom into the first barrier of infection, which is the membrane, then you see that something quite interesting happens. So AV is not 
quite going straight into the cell, but it knocks at the door. And what you what what happens there is really that you have a contact with the cell membrane, then the virus wanders away, comes again, and so on. And this is in the mean 4.5 repetitive touching events, which somehow takes uh, 3.2 seconds. And then either the virus wanders away or enters the cell. And only in 13% of uh, the interaction, these contacts results really in an entry. And if this entry then happens, it's really quite fast. As you can see here, it's milliseconds. So when you now put what we have seen in the microscope towards what is known for the infection biology, then you see that the following is, is happening. So our AEV is now approaching the cell membrane. And as you all know that on the cell membrane, we have a lot of receptors hanging around. And our AEV, in this case, AEV zero type two, is um, interacting, which is prim which the primary receptor, which is heparin sulfate proteoglycane. And what you saw with this bouncing, this knocking at the door, was the interaction with the capsid with these sugars trying to get the best fit. And if this fitting takes place on the capsid, then a conformational change takes place. And now the AV capsid has an epitope which allows the binding towards the internalization receptors. And the one which are known are alpha V beta 5 or alpha 5 beta 1 integrin. And an integrin on a cell surface is not just a molecule which sits there, this integrin can also communicate with the cell interior and paths, so to say, the way for the virus into the cell and then also forward towards the nucleus. So upon this interaction, we get a, a clattering mediated receptor um, mediated endocytosis. So the, uh, the vesicle is, or the endosome is built. And then these, these endosomes is hooked on the microtubules, which are the motorways of the cell. And these uh, AV containing um, endosomes are then transported as you have seen here in the movie within the cell into the direction of the nucleus. And what has been reported is that endosomes containing AV particles are having much more speed than common endosomes which are transported in the cell. And as you may know from your biological studies is that the, endosome, the endosomes maturate, so from early to late endosomes. And upon this maturation, the pH shifts and certain enzymes become active and so on. And with regard to AV, this pH shift results in a conformational change, again, a conformational change in the capsid exposing a domain which has a phospholipase. And this phospholipase, as the name already indicates, results in the formation of pores in the endosomal membrane, allowing AV particles then to be released into somehow the cytoplasm and then move forward to the nucleus where the gene tra transcription then takes place. So this, what I showed you now for AAV2, is quite similar to what you see with other serotypes as well. And of course, it's the same for the virus and the vectors. And you can see that we have your multiple steps and in each of these steps, we can have barriers towards transduction. And um, one discussion I would like, and here I would like to start off in how we can do, make AAV better, is in, in the cytoplasm. So when AV is released, AV can become a target of the proteasomal system. And that was the reason why Arun Sravastava and his whole group said that once we know which enzymes are capable of modifying the AV capsid, we can on the other hand then modify those residues that they are not no longer targets of this modification and therefore no longer targets of degradation. And when they did this, for example, here by changing tyrosine residues to phenylalanine, so really here, this is just a point mutation. And this is the increase in transgene expression, what you get 
is really showing you that once you understand the virus vector interaction, you really can, um, at the correct position in the life cycle, modify the vectors for the benefit later of gene and cell therapy. Because of course, if you have a higher efficacy, you, you need less variance or vector particles. Let us now again stop a little bit at the, the entry. So, and have a look at the pre-entry um, interactions because they are responsible for uh, huge parts of the first uh, challenges. So off-target transduction and low transduction efficacy. So I told you off-target transduction means that the vector is transducing types, uh, cell types, which in our application are not the targets. And this is due, of course, because a virus always would like to have a broad tropism uh, to, to be able to, to really replicate and produce progeny. So it's unusual for a virus to really have one cell type where it replicates. So we have to, to get rid of this off-target transduction if we would like to do a cell type specific in the gene transfer. And then, of course, if we use a lot of particles, then we also face the issue that we have an unspecific uptake into cells which are not our target cells. And then, for example, if we don't have the correct receptor, for example, if we don't have an HSPG on the surface, or if we don't have a correct internalization receptor, then we face a pre-entry barrier because the virus or the vector cannot bind and enter the cell. So this we can change by a technology called cell entry targeting. And for this, we first have to blind the AV capsid for the natural binding to its target receptors. And this we stay here again by, uh, for AV2 because most of it is known for AV2, the most the rep epitopes are mapped. Um, so how to blind the capsid? So this is again the AV capsid is not flat as you know we have protrusions here as you see these are the residues as the second highest protrusions and I mark them because nearby do we have we have two arginine residues which are the main residues responsible for the binding of heparin sulfate um, of the pro of heparin sulfate proteoglycans, and this is nicely shown here. So this is a sugar chain, which is really then lying here on the capsid. And if we now uh, mutate these residues, and this is work done again done by the Muchichka's lab here, mm -hmm. then we see the following. A heparin affinity chromatography column allows you to see if your vector is still binding to heparin sulfate because it's a, it's a molecule which um, uh, really is an analog to HSPG. And you see that if you load AV uh, wild type on the column, then it's really on the column and you do have it later on in your illusion fraction. However, if you mutate these two residues, the arginines to alanine, then what you see is that these vectors are not binding to the column anymore. So they are found in the flow through and in the wash. And since you don't have the binding to the primary receptor anymore, you see that your infectivity is severely um, reduced and impaired. So when you now have the capsid blinded for its first interaction, and I told you, you need the binding to the heparin sulfate proteoglycan for having the conformational change and then the interaction with the secondary receptor, then the next what you can do is really incorporate a new uh, ligand, which then directs this blinded particle to your receptor of choice. And I would like to show uh, with you to you one example, which was done in collaboration with Christian Buchholz from the Paul Ehrlich Institute in Langen, because he established um, the Darpin technology for targeting um, envelope viruses, and together uh, we worked on targeting of AV. And these Darpin molecules are so-called designed anchoring repeat proteins, which bind the respective target molecule with antibody-like affinity and specificity. They can be adapted for doing so that you really have a derpin for your target of choice. 
And um, these molecules in this particular ex um, uh, example was coupled and genetically fused to VP2, which when you remember is the second largest of the AV2 capsid proteins. And this one really allows the uh, genetic insertion of proteins which have their own structure. And this N-terminy of, um, of this fusion protein is then located on the surface, because what I have not told you is that the AV caps that do have pores at the five-fold symmetry axis. And through these pores, these fusion proteins are, are then extruded. And in particular here, you then have the DARPIN, which is ready for interacting with your receptor. And of course, these particles were also blinded for the natural binding to the attachment receptor HSPG. And if you now rem remember this, this picture here, I showed you as an off-target example for AV2. So AV2 injected into the mouse encoding for luciferase is not reaching this tumor tissue, but it's going into liver and spleen. While this a engineered AV, which is blinded for binding to heparin sulfate proteoglycan and now has a molecule on top, a DARPIN, which is specifically binding hair to NOI on the tumor cells, which is here um, uh, shown semantically, really finds after uh, um, intravenous application its, its tumor graft. And when you look also on DNA level, you really see that you have an off-target free, on-target delivery, which allows you really also to express via um, a um, constitutive active promoter, for example, a suicide gene. So it's really in um, a, a very tight interaction. Um, you remember, I already showed you um, this picture and I showed you this picture because not only because here is the binding site for the primary attachment receptor for uh, heparin sulfate proteoglycane, but also because these uh, the tips, which I marked here in green, uh, the tips of the second highest protrusion on the AV capsid uh, ideally suited also for uh, modifying the tropism of AV. And um, this is indeed the first example of a, of a successful cell surface targeting approach uh, with AV vectors done um, at that time by uh, Michael Hallig and colleagues. And here you find uh, the original picture. So this is an AV2 particle, in that case, transporting beta galactosidase as a transgene. And when you um, incubate them with B16 F10 melanoma cells, then you don't see any blue cells, so no transduction. However, if you insert at this position here genetically, the information, um, and this is the sequence here, that allows binding to beta-1 integrin, then this molecule, this AV particle now, finds the receptor on the B6NF10 mouse melanoma cells and can transduce the cell. And we have here a combination of already blinding and insertion in one step, because by inserting this peptide here, we separate these two arginines and destroy thereby the HSPG binding motif. And this also works with other peptides. Here is just um, an in vivo application shown. However, if you don't know what are your requirements. So with the example I showed you where we exactly know that we have a problem with entry, but afterwards in the cell, everything is fine with processing of the AV. So if you don't know what are the requirements uh, that lead to an efficient transduction, if you already have a vector which is quite good, but you would like to improve it or add novel features, or if you really would like to teach AV to transduce a cell type uh, through an interaction which is absolutely non-natural, so a non-natural infection route, then it's better that you are not trying to be smart, but that you um, ask nature how to do it, and so to do directed in vivo evolution. And in principles, three different library approaches are available. These are shown here schematically, but you can also combine the different approaches. 
What you see here are the capsid gene, the cap gene just displayed here as schematically. And you can, for example, introduce point mutations here into the uh, cap gene and then produce a library where the different AV variants just differ in the point mutation which is exposed on, on the capsid. Or you can shuffle the capsid gene because the different serotypes differ in the sequence. And so you can cut the cap, uh, the cap gene into little pieces and then relegate them, so shuffle them around, ending up with these mosaic capsids. Or you can do a display libraries where you decide for a certain serotype and then insert a random peptide sequence and then have the we really the scaffold still from your serotype with all those features, but then at the ligand, which then directs uh, the target, uh, the, the virus to, or the vector to your no, no, novel target receptor. And for all these different libraries, um, it's in principle the same steps. So you do the modification to, to the AAV on a DNA level. I showed you here in library, which is still based on a wild type genome. So the ITRs here, as you recognize the rep gene, the cap gene, and you introduce your mutation into the cap gene, and thereby coming from a, a plasmid, which where all the molecules are the same towards a pool, because this modification differs from this. And then you use this plasmid pool, this library plasmid pool for the generation of the AV library. And then, of course, this virus differs from this virus in the mutation, which is on the capsid. And what is absolutely essential is that the genotype and the phenotype is coupled. That means that the modification, which has been introduced on the DNA level, is indeed also shown on the capsid. This is important because your genome is later on the one where you do the identification of your best candidate. So with this library in hand, you can then move forward to your selections. And I cited here the first approaches for the error prone, the shuffling or the AV display libraries. And they of course started ex vivo where you have um, your cell type of interest seeded in a plate. And then you put your viral particles, your viral library on the cell. And then since AV requires the help of a helper virus, or at least the helper virus function, in the first approaches, in the initial approaches, adenoviral helper function was pro provided by adenovirus. And then those AV particles who have the right features for doing the whole life cycle ended up with progenies which then were used for another round of infection. The field has moved forward now because we do not want to have the helper viral function there anymore. Um, so we are now doing the same infection, but we are isolating the genomes from the target cell or even the target organ in the cell. So uh, like the nucleus. And then we are doing the cloning and progeny reproduction. So it's a new sub-library and we do the next round of selection. And the whole issue also works in vivo. And this is in particular powerful because you can really adapt the new virus, the new variant, which you would like to use also to your administration route. These libraries are really then uh, facing all of the inhibitory molecules in the sera, in, in the blood and so on, and have to move through all the barriers. So this is really where you can adapt your particles for the later use. And after you have done multiple rounds of selections, you then isolate um, the, the DNI from, uh, from the last round of selection and do next generation sequencing. And because you had the phenotype genotype coupling step, you can be sure that what you had on the capsid and which mediated the successful infection during your selection is then also encoded in, in the 
CAP gene, which you identified then with, by next generation sequencing. And so you can then produce your vector in the same way that the CAP gene has exactly those modification which you have selected for and which were successful in your library approach. And then you equip these vectors or these capsids with your transgene expression cassette or vector genome of choice. And just one short example for, for each of these libraries. And as I said, you can also in each of the rounds of selection um, introduce new mutations. You can also combine capsid shuffling with error prone and so on. But let us now really look for the pure um, libraries. So the error prone library, for example, um, has frequently been used to identify epitopes which are recognized by um, antibodies and also for select for immune escape variants. And this works like that. You have your distinct serotype where you really would like to stay to the features a serotype has, for example, infecting these, um, these cells here. And then you do the infection process in the presence of neutralizing antibodies. And only those AV particles which have point mutations in, in epitopes recognized by the neutralizing antibodies will be able to infect your cell. And so round after round, you really select for those who have escaping mutations on these residues. And if you come here, this is one result um, of a selection. This is uh, the pore at the five-fold symmetry axis. Here's a three-fold symmetry axis with the different spikes, which I already introduced you to. And you see that um, here, in particular, it's a spike reach, neutralizing antibodies are binding. And this is not surprising because these are residues or the spikes are the interaction uh, interfaces with the receptors. And so if you now have immune escape variants, you can use them for cell infection in the presence of neutralizing antibodies. Capsid shuffling, I told you that um, the cap gene of different serotypes are, are shuffled um, newly together, so um, digested and then shuffled um, around. And this is the original uh, or figure from the original work of the Grimm. And so what was done here was a um, selection on a hepatoma cell with the shuffled capsid library in the presence of neutralizing antibodies for those who nicely infect this hepatoma cell line. Or hepa and what you see then is when you do um, the sequencing of the best candidates, then you see that different serotypes contributing, uh, contributed to the building of the best candidate. And actually, this was the work where AVDJ was, was selected, which is working quite well on primary human hepatocytes. And now uh, let us move to the third library, which is the AV display library, which I really like for using um, uh, of or generation of AV variants with a redirected tropism because I still believe that if you really would like to do a redirection of the AV, you have to blind the capsid, as I told you before, and then insert and hook on a new specificity. And this you can, of course, not do when you just shuffle around parts of uh, the capsid gene. So this is an example, um, uh, primary human keratinocytes, which you would like, for example, to use in in for wound healing and to equip with genes which allow a nice engraftment of your of your um, skin sheet and so if you use AV2 and think it's a good choice then you face the problem that you do not get a, a transduction so these are primary keratinocytes of different donors we transported GFP as a um, transgene and you see that you're wi uh, wide below five percent of transduction of transduced cells when you put 5000 av particles on a single single keratinocyte two minutes when we... please it's only five minutes to... yeah okay. and when you look closer at uh, what happens here then you see that the primary receptor is missing 
And so we have a classical pre-entry barrier. And so you can do your library approach as I introduced you to. And then we ended up with the following candidates. So these sequences were found in these positions here. And so we generated vectors having these sequences on top. And then if you transduce now the keratinocytes with these capsid modified vectors, then you see that these ligand is now capable of mediating the cell infection because all the cells are green now. And now you can use um, uh, this mutant, which you have in hand now, to understand which receptor has been targeted. So, of course, it looks already like an integrin, but whom of the uh, huge panel of integrins? And uh, this was done by comparative gene analysis, where you really look on different cell lines, where you exactly know the receptors on the cell surface, and thereby we identified beta-8 integrin as a candidate. And this is indeed on keratinocytes. And when you now look at the ligand, this is the one which was selected and then is a neutral one. You see really the power of this technology. So what I showed you is that you can tackle all these issues by capsid modification with exception of the pre -ex And uh, I would like also to show you a first example on escaping for the pre-existing immunity. I already showed you with the error-prone libraries, but you can also do it by insertion libraries. Here, the neutralization, but if you have here a, a peptide, then this allows you also to escape neutralization because the mutation is done exactly as at the site where antibodies are binding. So you can also go for the genome and it will be quite fast. So the AAV genome expresses in the cell nucleus. We have we form, epi, uh, we form episomes, so we have a low risk of insertion and mutagenesis. We have, uh, despite this, we have a low long-term transient expression in slowly proliferating cells, mm -hmm. and which is, of course, very good if you would like to have also a transient expression in proliferating cells. However, if you would like to have a long-term expression in proliferating cells, this is not working with a common AV genome. And uh, so we thought it would be good to equip this with something which allows to hook the AV vector genome on to the uh, chromosomes. So we integrated a sequence called scaffold matrix attachment region. This is how the AV looks like. And uh, when you now look, uh, do a long-term um, cultivation, you see that you really have a long-term stable expression. And if you look for the insertion, then you see you don't have an insertion, but your AV is really ma maintained as an episome and replicates once per cell cycle. And by this, I would like to stop and I would be happy to take your question. Um, thank you for listening. And just, I would like to mention that this is always a teamwork and I would like to thank uh, my great team at Hannover Medical School and my former member, members at Cologne. And I would like also to thank all the colleagues working on AV vector development, infection biology and crystallography. And I tried to mention at least some of their works. Many, many thanks, Legard. Thanks a lot for your very inspiring talk. We only have two minutes for two questions. <laughs> so the first one is coming from Arjun from the TGEN, and his question is, given the importance of the endosomal machinery in the transduction of cells with AAVs, can chemomodulation of autophagy pathways enhance the transduction efficacy of these vectors? Yes, yeah, so um, we have shown that autophagy um, is not only induced by AV vectors, but also that if you induce autophagy, AV vectors are more efficient in transgene expression. Okay, thank you. And the second and I'm afraid last question from George uh, Fritzinger from the University of Leeds. How do the presented engineering approaches to change AAV tropism affect 
tighter uh, genetically modified so I couldn't hear the last part of your question, but it's titers, I understood. And uh, so it uh, depends on what you do to the capsid. And if you do the library approaches, in most of the cases, the capsid is a nearly wild type. So like the unmodified one. If you think you are sp smart and put something on top, it could be that the titers are lower, but also their um, technologies have been established like hybrids or so. Because we must finish at uh, two forty-five, we should uh, stop here. We, and yes, we still have three to three minutes left, if you like. Okay, <laughs> okay. If that is possible, uh, could you comment about the possibility of doing more than one uh, cycle of inoculation? with AAVs in patients that are treated in very early stages of growth, thinking on hemophilia or other diseases that may require a subsequent administration. Would it be possible to do some type of immunosuppression for this? Yeah, so it, it really depends on the vector dose and the route of application you are, you are taking. So as you may know that um, the gene therapy done for the eye allowed to do um, reapplication or application into the second eye. Uh, this was possible in the same patient. However, if you, for example, think about the liver, of course, you have a lot of uh, more vectors. So you have to think either to change the serotype or to, to try to do immune suppression to avoid production of antibodies. Okay, many thanks for sharing all your experience with all of us. And to finish, I would like to invite all the audience here to our next e-school that will take place on next Wednesday, the 10th of June. And this will be given by uh, Dr. Sultan Nivix, who will talk about the relevance of a sleeping beauty transposase. In particular, he will open the field of non-viral vectors in gene therapy. Thank you very much. Bye.